many people at the end of the day, such a stimulating day maybe. Uh, so now that the organizers have put me uh, you, between you and the Jemba Jam, uh, so let me get started and try to be on time. Um, yeah, though the organizers have requested for the questions at the end, uh, if there is something pressing, just let me know during the talk. Uh, and I'll try to end like 10 minutes before <coughs> the scheduled time so that we have plenty of talk time. Okay, so my name is Shorya Roy. I'm a scientist and a manager in Xerox Research in uh, Bangalore. Um, and the talk that I'm going to give uh, today is, uh, is titled Transfer Learning in Practice. Um, so there is a two parts to the talk. Uh, so in the first part, um, I'll, I'll give a very basic introduction to the uh, transfer learning topic, just covering at the breadth level, at a very, very high level, just uh, so that you know what we are talking about. Uh, I'm sure there are many knowledgeable people here who may be already knowing it, but those will probably be a repetition, so pardon me for that. The second part, I will be talking about that how we put that in practice. That's the, that's the, that's the focus. And that part has kind of uh, been <coughs> uh, published in uh, multiple conferences in artificial intelligence and computational linguistics the last year and this year. Okay, so so getting started with the talk, uh, so let me go, what is the motivation for, for this talk, right? And what the first diagram that you see on your screen is a, is a, is a cartoon depicting a very, very common supervised learning framework, right? Uh, so we have a bunch of training data uh, from, from some domain. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, algorithms which can be trained using those training data to create something called a model. And that model is applied on a test data, right? I mean, again, most of you will be familiar with this term. Now, a major assumption uh, which is behind this, uh, this paradigm is uh, essentially about this nature of the training data and test data. They are expected to be same, and speaking in the little bit formally, so the, the joint distribution of the data and the labels, uh, and some of these uh, <coughs> data and class labels, as is called in the supervised setting, are coming from the same distribution. Of the uh, for both the training and the test data, and under that assumption, all the all the work that has gone into the learning theory uh, kind of holds true. Now, if that doesn't hold true, then it's a problem, right? So let me let me give you an example. So we all are familiar, probably like sentiment categorization, like it is like again probably a beaten to death problem uh, where customer, uh, sorry, user-generated content is some needs to be categorized into different groups like positive, negative, neutral, or like on a scale of zero to five or something like that, right? We are all interested. I mean, the commercial entities and organizations are interested to know that what, what are people thinking about uh, their products. Now, we wrote a sentiment classification algorithm and we tried that with, uh, with, with, with some of the products, as you can see that uh, books, DVDs, uh, kitchen, and electronics. And this is, this is part of actually a very, very standard data set uh, used, in, used in this literature. Uh, they were, these reviews are collected from uh, one of the popular e-commerce website. Now, what we did is that we, as I said, that we built a sentiment classifier for, uh, for one of these products and applied it on the test data. And we got some performance metric classification accuracy of about 87, 88%. Now, instead of training on the same data, if we would have trained it on a different product's comments and applied on, the, on that earlier domain A, we see that the, the accuracy gone down by almost 20%, right? And that is where lies the motivation of this problem, that you cannot train a model on a data set and apply it on a data set which is, varyingly, which is very, very different from there because then the performance degrades. So now coming back, now this is formally as in essentially known as that the basically the what is happening is that this joint distribution of these two data sets are not matching. And as a result, the, uh, the uh, performance of the algorithm is degrading. And why this happens? Well, it may happen because there are many products and many domains are, are there. And I'll, I'll talk about the word domain a little later. But many, many, I mean, things, things get changed from training and test. And the other reason is that even within, a same, within the same domain, the the astronomical rate at which user-generated content is produced these days, it may be the case that the data has got outdated. The training data gets outdated, and you cannot uh, apply it on the data that is being generated today. Right? So you need to, again, what we call as a retrain the model. You have to, again, have a set of people label those data and retrain these models. Right? Now, that's the, that's the challenge. That's the challenge that we would like to address here. 
Now, summarizing what I just said here, uh, that you have a domain A and domain B, and you want to build the same learning system, but if you want to do this in the traditional way, you have to build the system every time from scratch. Every time you have to get the label data and, and, and do that. It is not only time consuming and expensive and have require involvement from uh, human labelers, but at the same time, I mean, you cannot kind of do this very fast uh, if your data is generating uh, or getting changed at, at a very fast pace. On the other hand, the transfer learning, in contrast, allows these domains and tasks and these distributions used in the training and test data to be different. And we'll see how this is done, but that's, that's the thing. And it is based on this fundamental philosophy that reuse the knowledge. The knowledge that you have learned while building the system for one time, use that knowledge. And this is something very, something very similar to what human or maybe children do uh, quite effectively, right? Uh, I mean, learning to recognize apples can help you to identify pairs, right? Or learning to play cricket can eventually help you to play baseball. With, with, a, with a caveat, maybe, I'll, I'll come to that. And then, so that's, the, that's essentially the philosophy that we would like to do here, so that we do not have to every time go for this expensive labeling process. And again, this is again another cartoon, it's a very simplified flow of transfer learning. Uh, just to key points, there is something called a source domain, where there is a lot of label data is available. There's a target domain, but there's a lot of unlabeled data is available, which is very inexpensive to get. And maybe, a f and I mean, in some cases, there may be a very small amount of labeled data for the target domain is also available. These two things are fed into a, is something called a transfer learning model, transfer learning algorithm, and which creates something called a, the, the, something, the predictive model, which can be applied now on the target domain test data. So now you have a model for the target domain test data without requiring to have a lot of labeled data as you needed for in source domain. This, this is also known as the transfer learning, and again, with minor differences, which is not relevant for this talk, is also kind of no, uh, is referred to as the domain adaptation task. Um, and there are other, other related terminologies like multi, mm, uh, multitask learning, where you try to learn for both the source and target domain together. Again, we are not covering that, but here we are trying to, using the source domain, we want to get the best performance in the target domain. That's the, that's the goal that we have. Now, the, uh, and, and, and I should clarify the word domain, uh, because this will keep coming in, that domain is not necessarily in our popular terminology that it is, doesn't have to be like as, as b different or as big as like healthcare is a domain and finance is another domain, right? In fact, uh, it can be a, a very small collection within a, within, a, within a particular larger, con larger uh, concept of domain, right? For example, from one healthcare company to another healthcare company, right? I mean, just for this talk, we can kind of tell them that, um, that any two collections which do not match with respect to certain attributes are called as two domains. And what are these things, right? So let's just look into that. Uh, what is these uh, transfer learning settings uh, that, that, are commonly, that commonly happen? So there are two key notions in the transfer learning. One I have been already referring to is domains. That is what I will cl clarify a little bit more formally here. And the second one is tasks. I, that is the next slide. Now, a domain is essentially consists of two components, a feature space and a marginal probability distribution on that feature space. So a feature space, again, from going back to the sentiment classification example, the list of all words or the vocabulary, as we commonly use in a text classification terminology, that's the feature space that you have. And the marginal probability distribution is the, what is the, what is the probability of a particular set of words appearing in a review, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the again, I'm putting these things simply, but essentially these two attributes uh, define a domain. And as you now can see that, these two can be different between any two document collections, it doesn't necessarily have to be as, uh, as, as, as popularly, commonly uh, used terminologies like domains. Now, given that these two things are there, uh, the uh, feature space and the marginal probability distribution, so the domains can differ in two different ways, right? One is the feature space are different. What is an example for that? Say, web pages which are written in English and Chinese. Again, so they are different, right? You cannot build a model in the web page for English, web page classification, and apply it to a Chinese, because it, the, 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 the features are different, so you cannot uh, do that. The other thing is that the marginal probability differs, right? Uh, even though two web pages are written in English, if they are blogs on politics and religion, and you want to do certain classification within the politics, cannot, can you just take that model and apply it to uh, the uh, ones on the religion? Probably not, right, or not. So. So that's the other way uh, two domains may differ. As I was mentioning, the other characterizing uh, attribute here is the task uh, uh, beyond domain. So task is again consists of two components, 
a label space and a function. A label space is the is the label, <coughs> the class labels that we uh, would like to assign to different um, objects, right? For the sentiment categorization, there were like positive, negative, neutral. These were the three labels, right? The other one, the function, which is essentially we are trying to learn, given an unknown test example, how can we say that which label category it belongs to? That's and again, probabilistically, it can be written as probability y given x. That is given given an x x or given an uh, given a feature vector, what is the label, the class label that you have learned based on the training data that has been provided, right? Now, again, so here also these two things can differ. Uh, the if the label spaces are not same, the common example is this binary versus multi-class classification, uh, where you have two labels versus n number of labels, and you probably don't know what is the connection between these two label sets. And the second thing is that where the label spaces are, are different, and as we call it, the decision function has changed. Essentially, that the label sets may be the same, but the uh, but the character but the label sets, the way they are characterized by the con by the feature vectors are different between these two cases. So, under this setting or covering these uh, four combinations, two cross two combinations, there have been the transfer learning literature has been developed over the last, I would say, since 1995, where it was introduced the first time in a, in a NIPS workshop called Learning to Learn. Uh, so the vast amount of literature has been developed in this, in this field. But, and if I could like to summarize it, it uh, in, in, in one slide, then there are like three very, very fundamental guiding questions are there. Uh, which is uh, which is actually I've taken from this paper by with a very uh, nice survey paper by Pan and Yang. And if you guys are interested in this topic and would like to kind of get yourself introduced, uh, this is a very nice uh, paper to start off uh, with. Uh, it appeared in I, uh, the Transaction Knowledge and Data Engineering in 2010. Uh, so the, the three questions are essentially what to transfer. So essentially some knowledge and I have to kind of keep this word knowledge abstract, but it's specific for individual domains or tasks. And some knowledge may be common between multiple domains or two domains that are under in consideration. So we need to identify that what to transfer. And that's the first question that we need to answer. The second part is that how do we do that? And that is where the, all the algorithms and the techniques have been developed. And I will touch upon in the next slide just to tell you that, okay, what, uh, what kind of techniques that have been developed. And the final, uh, so the first two questions has attracted probably the maximum amount of work in this field. The last one, to answer when to transfer, under a particular scenario, given two domains, the way we defined it, is it worthwhile to do transfer, right? And just to kind of give you an analogy going back to the previous examples that I gave, knowing the tennis ball is round, is, 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 a, is a sphere, doesn't help me to probably recognize what a pair is. Knowing how to do nice leg glance in cricket probably doesn't help me to play better baseball, right? In that case, probably transfer is not going to help, and that is what the phenomena is called this negative transfer. And this is a this is a topic which has re 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 received relatively less attention, but we will t I'll tell you in the second part of the talk that why this is crucial when we talk about practically deploying such such techniques. And selecting or combining multiple sources is another kind of uh, related question that should you s adapt from one source versus multiple, but again, I will just kind of touch upon towards the end just uh, so that you are aware that this is a topic. Uh, so now, on the final slide, on the first part of this talk here, so the transfer learning literature, and again, by very, very uh, nicely categorized by Pan and Young, that there are like different kinds of algorithms have been proposed. I mean, like, there are hundreds of papers have been written on these things, right? So these, but these can be categorized into like, in these four broad buckets. And I, I'm, I, I probably will not go into the details, but just to give you the sense that what is this? What does, so what does instance-based approaches mean? The intuition there is that when you have a source domain and the target domain, you have labeled it in the source domain, you want to learn a classifier on the target domain, only certain instances probably in the source domain are going to be providing useful information about the classification in the target domain. Identify those, that's your knowledge, that's your what to transfer, and how is that you probably you give them higher importance in your supervised classification algorithm. I mean, and that's plenty of classification algorithm. You just, you, you, you reweigh certain instances or upweigh certain instances uh, based on which are going to provide useful information from one domain to another. That's essentially the principle of instance-based approaches. 
Se so maybe continuing on the second one, the feature-based approaches. So what is the intuition there? And again, I mean, you can read plenty of papers are referred in these in these survey papers if you are interested in to know the actual techniques. So I'm just going to give you the intuition here. The feature-based approaches is essentially. Uh, so we 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 know that <coughs> these two domains are probably different, and they are from the two different feature spaces. Now, can you define a new space where if the source domain instances are projected, target domain instances are also projected, and their distances are reduced? Ideally, you'd like to find a space where if you project them, their distance is minimized. Now, by what is happening by doing that? Now, in this space of source domain instances, which are labeled, by the way, if I learn a classifier, that will be very sim that will be very relevant for the target domain as well because the, in this space the target domain instances are also very similar to the source domain, right? And now you give back bring back the labels and associate with the target domain instances. So that's again is the intuition for the um, uh, with feature based approaches, so on and so forth. There are these parameter based approaches, relational based approaches, uh, which which have been developed uh, in this in this domain. Now. It has been, as I was saying, that it has been a hot topic in research in the machine learning, artificial intelligence, computational linguistic, computer vision, all these, all these scientific conferences, and there are tutorials, workshops, papers, all, all these things. But extremely rich literature, and that was, that was our observation, that extremely rich literature, literature, but much less applications in practice. And that is the sweet spot we wanted to hit, to see how the vast amount of literature that has been developed, how those can be applied as it is or maybe by, by innovating on them. And secondly, what are the new questions we need to answer to apply them into the real practice or real life? And that is where I will move to the uh, second uh, part of the talk. Maybe I can pause for a briefly and just see that if there is any, any pressing question at this point. The organizers maybe may not like it because they have said that not to ask for questions. <laughs> <coughs> okay, cool. Okay, so anyway, so let me let me proceed on that. So the problem that we applied this thing, this transfer learning, is for social media analytics. I'm sure everybody, all of, all of us, know that social media analytics. Right? It's, it's a, we have to do this. I mean, just so much of content and so much of data is available. If we cannot mine insights, uh, uh, it, it, it's a waste, right? So I work for this. I work for Xerox. So Xerox has this product called Empath, uh, which is a social media analytics product. Which again, uh, it has it has some unique differentiating features. But at the same time, I mean, it has does some of the some of the some of the very common things in terms of this categorization of sentiment and topic categorization, um, identification of uh, geolocation, um, event detections, and all 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 these kinds of things. Um, so. We are going to focus on the sentiment categorization and topic categorization. These are the two tasks. And as I have been building it up till now, uh, so transfer learning is applied for the supervised learning or the classification or categorization problem. And that is where this, 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 uh, uh, this topic is also relevant for the real life example. Now, <clears throat> so this is a typical workflow. It's a little bit busy slide. I will not get into a whole lot of details. I don't know if it is visible. So basically, there are four steps to the uh, a, a, a process of this of this product empath, as we call it. So it's listen, analyze, engage, and measure. Um, I'm just uh, at high level. I'm just telling you that listen is essentially collecting or crawling the data. Analyze is the is the task of is the task of um, labeling the data building the model and validating those and and the usual supervised learning uh, workflow engage is essentially applying those models and and see them how they are working in real life and measure is essentially kind of measure the impact roi business impact and things like that the the module that is of interest to us or that that we wanted to uh, hit is this particular analyze module as you can see that this is the part where every time expensive and time consuming human annotation has to come and now here the notion of domain is again very important right any collection that we we crawl from the from say uh, twitter becomes one domain if fifth elephant there has been a lot of tweets are going on around fifth elephant if we want to collect that okay what is what is what what are you guys saying about fifth elephant are you saying positive negative or are you guys neutral i collect all the fifth elephant related tweets very easy to do and then i want to build that model now this is something i have to do it really quick i have to do it today and give it to zainab saying that uh, please this is uh, feedback especially the negative ones and see if you can address it by tomorrow if i give it to her on monday i mean i'm sure she won't mind but but it will be of less use right because i can't address i mean maybe 
in the sixth edition of Fifth Elephant, we can, we can address that. So we have to do this really fast, and that's why you can't have these people labeling 200, 500 tweets sitting there and, and, and doing this building model and things like that. Now that's the, first, the, the second reason that I mentioned about this fast data evolving. So retraining model on scratch on new label data is not a feasible solution in this case. So we propose this uh, transfer learning uh, methodology, and let me just quickly skip this guy, which is essentially going to do these two things, minimize human annotation and reuse previous knowledge. We are, again, the key point in this slide is that we are hitting the analyze, analyze step, which is the most uh, time consuming step. As I said, this is, this is a text classification task. I mean, at the after, after understanding the broader business context, when I work with uh, my colleagues, and I essentially trans convert this into one of the technical problem, one of the scientific problem, right? And the scientific problem here is the text classification. So we have to build a, we have a domain, we, ha we have a lot of uh, label data from different collections. We have to build a model and apply it for the, uh, uh, all the fifth elephant uh, uh, tweet, which is my domain two, for which I don't have any label data. Uh, the challenges are uh, that if I do it directly, and as I showed you in the sentiment classification example in the, in the beginning, uh, the, there will be significant performance drop, and hence the models has to be trained every time from scratch. Perfectly, we have done our job converting from the real business problem to a converting into a transfer learning problem, right? Now, at this point in time, I, we could have gone ahead, and we did indeed also. Uh, the we applied one of the uh, instance-based, one of the feature-space-based algorithm, and see that and saw the what is the what is the what is the outcome that we are getting. Now, by doing a lot of experimentation and brainstorming, we realized that there are two key challenges that we still need to address, which would make them practically feasible in real life. One is, <coughs> while in the, in the literature we say that, okay, there's a source domain and there's a target domain, right? In this case, we had hundreds of collections which were already labeled and tagged by people. We have to understand that which domain to select and from where to transfer for the new collection, right? And that is where we say we introduce this notion of the similarity aware transfer learning. Transfer from a, from a collection which is similar to the target collection. If you are trying to label the fifth elephant collection, you try to label it using uh, using another another maybe a big data conference related tweets, right? And not from a not from a medical insurance tweets. The other one, and again, this is something as a part of the algorithm. I'll, I'll explain in the next slide also that in st most of the algorithm in the literature have been like this one shot transfer. You do all these feature space mapping, shopping things, and just just transfer and and project and transfer and be done with it. Here we mentioned that, and here we actually essentially did this in a manner which we call as the um, sim iterative transfer or similarity of our slow transfer in multiple iteration, depending on how well we are doing or how confident we are doing as we are progressing. Right? Now, now as, 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 as computer science people, we just love flowcharts, so let me just have this uh, flowchart with hopefully a little bit more uh, uh, clarifying as, as compared to what I said in the last slide. So essentially, there are these, these are the main steps that are, that are there in our proposed technique to apply transfer learning for social media analytics. So first step is the, so is the similarity analysis, where we are uh, essentially uh, doing that, okay, how similar is the domain from one, one domain to another. The next three steps is adaptation, model building, and result analysis is the key transfer learning algorithm. And for the algorithm, I would refer you to the pre paper that uh, was mentioned in the previous slide, uh, where which is essentially this iterative transfer based on uh, the uh, similarity as well as the confidence I am getting. The result analysis leads to these two questions, that is the transfer satisfactory already or not? If not, then what we do is that, and this is again another innovation, another, I would say that little the cherry on the top, is that I bringing in this notion of active learning into this framework. So while we have assumed that is, there is no label data available on the target domain, at this point in time, we say that, well, the, what the adaptation that we have done is not satisfactory for you because you have not given any label data. Can you label like 20, 25 samples for me? And uh, I will try to see that what is the best I can do here. Now, instead of selecting those 20, 25 samples at random from the collection, we apply active learning. And active learning, and again, many of you may be knowing, is essentially identifying the instances which would help you to build a classifier better from a big collection of unlabeled uh, data. And then we, into, we, we kind of attach that uh, small amount of label data to the algorithm, and that is the loop is iterating till we get a satisfactory uh, uh, answer here. Once it is done, you save model, you apply, and you uh, be done with it. 
Right? Let me show you a quick video. Sorry, I should have opened it. So this is the mute video, so I'll give a commentary here. So basically what we are doing here is the for in this case, this is the social media product in Empath where the transfer learning has been embedded. I'm sorry. Thank you. Where transfer learning has been embedded. Um, so these are the different collections that are there already in the in the in the crawl mode. So we we have collected this particular collection and say that we would like to build a, um, uh, a classification exam for 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 this for this collection and we don't have any label data. So what we go go there and and add this collection to our our system and then on the right side what you see is the relevant source collections from the corpus which are already labeled has been identified and this is based on the similarity between the content and we don't use any labeled information at this point in time and a person who is user uh, can actually go and see some of the comments which have been crawled for this particular uh, for this particular collection the one that i would like to uh, the target domain collection i would like to ca categorize and then the person among the selected source domain, we could have selected automatically the first one, which is the most similar, but we kind of give them uh, this option to the user to select one of them as the uh, one to transfer from. And again, you can, the analyst can actually go and look into the source domain comments uh, and to see that uh, whether they are, they are good, right? And then the adapt and test button is actually in, uh, initiating that iterative module where the source domain collection is being used to train a model for the target domain. And now what you see on the right side is that essentially these many instances have been classified as positive, negative, neutral from the target collection, right? Now we cannot compute an accuracy because there is no label data at this point in time. So we just ask the analysts or whoever is actually using it that this is the first round of data that we have given. Based on that, you can you just go through the, some of these comments which have been categorized and tell us that whether this is satisfactory or not. And if this is satisfactory, uh, not satisfactory, we go to this, this add data module, which is the active learning, which is the step that I said that can you give me 20, 25 samples uh, to label. And uh, once that, that part is there, and this is the part where the person is essentially labeling the data as positive, negative, neutral on the right side. And this is a manual step, but this is an optional step only if, only if they believe that it is not good enough, it is not satisfactory at this point in time. So we um, annotate all the selected comments in this round, and then we go to the iteration of adapt and test. And this is something can go on till the time the person feel that, okay, it is satisfactory or not satisfactory. And now, as you can see that, that some of the data have been tagged, so we can also compute what is the accuracy of, of these, right? Otherwise, the there is no way you can compute the accuracy because the, there is no label data. Of course, if you had a held out data set, you can uh, still compute a validation accuracy um, or something like that. But in a real life setting, when a, when, a, when a person who is doing social media analytics is actually using it, can 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 just go through the comments and essentially identify that uh, how how well this is uh, this is doing. So now, if I go back to the slides, and again, so there is a bunch of results slide. I'll probably just go over only one, and and so essentially, so this is a slide that is showing that where. We, we had a test collection on Apple iPhone 6, and this is just, a, just as an experimental details. Uh, Apple iPhone 6, we didn't have any label data, and the, we selected the source based on the similarity analysis from a collection which is Huawei, and again, they are related domain. But the slide that is kind of essentially pointing out is that the deep red uh, bar, which is indicating the, adapt, the accuracy with the transfer learning uh, incorporated, and the light pink one is the one that is without, without uh, accuracy incorporated. The first bar where, which is showing, which is highlighted in green, is essentially showing that how much of accuracy you can get even if you do not have any label data from the target domain. And if this result, if this number is good enough for you, you are done with it. You, are, you have just crawled a collection and you have built a sentiment classifier automatically, directly from, uh, from based on an existing source collection, right? And similar results you obtained for, again, I mean, a bunch of, bunch of data sets, bunch of uh, other collections from the social media that we used. Um, 
in summary, we essentially kind of observed that uh, on an average, uh, we could outperform the only supervised model with using only one fifth of the total labeled instances, right? So, which is like a saving of almost 80% uh, in terms of the manual accuracy. But more than that, it makes the system automatic completely as you are going, 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 uh, going forward. Now, an, an important part of deploying such a technique in practice is that these accuracy numbers may not mean much by the actual practitioner. Right? So they are going to actually try this system out. So we had to run a something called an analyst trial by a bunch of people who used to do this labeling earlier right? and told them that why don't you try out this tool and give us user feedback or rating based on that how good you think they are doing. Right? Now at the end of that, uh, their feedback was that okay, usability is like 5 on 5, reduction in effort is 4 on 5. I mean we got pretty good result in terms of, uh, in terms of the not only in the scientific accuracy numbers but at the same time we got uh, a lot of lot of good feedback from people right in terms of who are actually using this thing now so this this is this is uh, the the system aspect and the analyst trial results and some of these things we kind of we have a paper paper in the north american association of computational linguistic conference uh, where uh, we showed that how to actually again i mean the first paper was more about the technique the second paper was more about the trial and and how how it worked in practice with the with a large large amount of practical uh, data sets and everything now let me just move on to okay again so this is this is another application in the in the in the uh, in the domain which is on the on more on the conversation labeling uh, task and there the task was this engagement labeling or identifying that uh, a, a lot of conversations these days happen over the social media channel in terms of the customer support related things like um, a query or a question is being is asked and the and the agents are monitoring these these channels and they have they are supposed to address and at the end of it these these queries need to be either marked as like open closed um, or solved and and things of that nature and again this can be modeled as a supervised classification problem um, a multiple a fine grained model is uh, kind of also is, is possible which we call as the um, the conversation labeling task but again essentially if you if you just model this as a supervised classification problem the the uh, the you cannot just again the same same issue of the domain domain divergence comes in in practice right so without getting into the much detail and again so the we, we we use the conversation analysis using sample data from some of the telecom operators and and the financial uh, system these are very very small data but essentially this is the part that actually helped us to communicate the benefit of the transfer learning even before we did the social media analytics and again so here also we see that a number of uh, uh, significant benefit in terms of using the transfer learning instead of using the uh, supervised model as it is directly into the into this into into the system sorry i had to rush this part just to make sure that i i give enough time for the question answers and stuff uh, let me come to the final part on the <coughs> on the couple of talks or a couple of couple of thoughts on that okay what are the uh, further research that happened beyond the practical deployment of of the of the transfer learning technique that I mentioned um, so one of the common problem that we realized that when we were applying transfer learning on the social media data sets that in the literature mostly this transfer happens from single source to a single target but in practice, we many times have these multiple source domains available, right? Now, for example, in the social media context, we had like hundreds of co collections already labeled. Now, given a new collection, why do I have to always choose the best, most similar, even though we are doing in a similarity aware manner, why do I have to learn from only from the, only from the source domain directly, right? I can learn from multiple source domains effectively, perhaps, by extending the similarity aware iterative algorithm. And that is where we introduce this <coughs> Uh, this notion of the similarity and complementary properties of, of domains to identify the best K domain uh, from a learning algorithm, a transfer learning algorithm can learn and apply to a target domain. And again, in the, in the, so we, we, this is more of a theoretical uh, work that where we provided this theoretical justification for the source selection procedure and also give like kind of guarantees on mistake bounds for the uh, MSID algorithm that it cannot get worse than uh, a lower bound and things of that nature. And finally, um, and this is a this is a work that will be presented in a couple of weeks to the in this ACL conference. Is this uh, all the all the transfer learning examples I gave are all examples of the task where the number of labels are same between the source and in the target domain. 
right? If the source and target domain labels are not same and the tasks are essentially varying, how do we, um, can we, can we apply cross domain adaptation uh, with disparate labels? And that is the main focus of this, um, all of this paper where we kind of, again, model this problem as a, <coughs> as an, op uh, as an optimization problem of maximum coverage and propose a greedy approach to show that how you can select new set of labels for the target domain, even if you we do not have any idea that uh, what are the labels that are going to be, just based on the number of labels available. Uh, now, finally concluding, so what we covered here, uh, again, so the machine learning based automation and the need for transfer learnings, I hope I motivated that the need for transfer learning, why we need that in practical setting. Um, I gave a high level introduction of transfer learning and if you guys are interested, I'll be very happy to give you further pointers. Some of, some of them are I have mentioned in the slide. Um, showed one example, transfer learning in practice for social media analytics, we are doing multiple other things for uh, in very, very different problems to show that how pervasive this could be. And I also talked about some of the ongoing research direction with this multi-source adapt adaptation and the with disparate label sets. So with that, I'll stop here and thank you. Okay, we can begin with the Q and A. If you have any questions, just raise your hands. Hello. So one question is, I think uh, the use cases that you have mentioned is, you know, more on the social analytics and you know this one. When you need a more accuracy, you know, like of that. So how do you think? Or what is the what is the recommendation? Can you really can you give me an example? What do you mean by more accuracy? I as mean, in healthcare. If I really, you know, like looking at the patients and then trying to classify whether you know it is genuine or not. So do you think that it's really going well, to Well, that is where the, absolutely, that's a good point. And that is where we introduce this notion of the satisfactoriness or not. Because you just cannot apply your transfer learning algorithm and expect that the performance is performing good. It may perform good, but you need to get a validation step to know that, okay, whether this is satisfactory or not. Yes, in healthcare, uh, the, the level of accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity, this requires to be much higher. Uh, but again, we, with a manual intervention in place, we think we can apply that. So what you mentioned is the manual intervention may be more in those cases where you need more accuracy probably than the I mean manual intervention is a tool you may apply a rigid manual intervention when you are very very specific about the particular outcome um, maybe in a social media analytics you can be less less rigid about it okay thank you hello hello Can you hear me? Hey, uh, what I could think that the crux of this whole approach will be to identify what is that thing which is invariant from one domain to other and across time. What is the systematic way of extracting that thing which is going to be invariant so that I can, that what part of it basically? Sure, sure. I just want to have some intuitive feel of it. Right, and that is where the, I indeed, the invariance is the, is the crux of it, right? You want to identify that what you can transfer, because that is what is invariant across these two domains. And the way of doing it is these instance-based approaches and feature-based uh, based mapping-based approaches. So essentially, you want to map to a different feature space where these two domains are invariant you will not be able to distinguish between these two domains. And if you can identify such a feature space, so that becomes like in the... Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there are absolutely many techniques are there. I did not get into that. I mean, for example, even canonical correlation analysis is a way you can identify that what is, a, what is that invariant space. Um, there is a very famous technique called structural correspondence learning which identifies that what is invariant between this. And let me give you an intuitive example. In the sentiment classification example, there are certain words which are invariant across domains. They are positive or negative irrespective of the domains. Excellent, best, good. These are always positive irrespective of the domain. Well, there you have to identify. So these, these things are called as pivots or invariant pivots. Right, so you, once you identify such invariants, which may be different for a different language, I'm just telling you the example where the feature distributions are different, right? In that, with respect to those features, you can actually then identify that, okay, what are the other features that are going to be positive or negative? Okay, hi, my name is Uday. Uh, as you saw the social media analytic tools, so my, uh, basically, uh, two question. One, while considering the model, uh, did you take in this uh, LM natural language processing? If, if yes, how much was the weightage? 
um, just let me make sure that I understood the question. So the, uh, you are asking that how did we decide on the weight of the instances? Uh, yeah, uh, in social media generally uh, the guys r write, I mean their language is very difficult to identify. So generally we use this uh, natural language, uh, language process for to identify the whole uh, meaning of sentence. So uh, did you consider this one while uh, doing the modeling? I mean this linguistic pre-processing is needed irrespective of whether you use transfer learning or not whether to how to remove the noise how to canonicalize them how to tokenize them how to make sense of smileys and things of those nature so those i am not even getting into the those are those are needed once you have done that and that you have done that you have to do for every domain once you have done that then how do you identify that okay what is the source domain instance which is more similar to a target domain Right, and that is where this algorithm and you can yeah refer to the paper to see more details how we are doing the weighing and things like that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, when you say we do our transfer learning and check if it is satisfactory or not, right? So how do you identify that? Because we have the new data unlabeled. It's not labeled. So how do you identify that? Can you be Good catch. We, we assume there is a validation data set. Okay. Once we have a validation data set, then we can do a satisfactory identification. In case we don't have that, the analyst has to manually, or whoever is actually analyzing the data, has to manually go through, as you saw in the demo, is actually going through some examples and saying that whether this looks good or not. Now, how much you can do that, that depends on how much of uh, manpower you have. So, uh, I mean, once we have our results uh, ready with the transfer data, we randomly pick something an analyst analyzes and then, so basically again, one more validation has to happen from manual intervention is there, right there as well? Well, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an optional step. If you do not want to do that, I can do that one shot transfer based on similarity aware or all the, all the things that we are doing, and then you can give you the prediction. But what we find in practical setting, people are okay to validate certain prediction. Va and again, mind it, validation is less time consuming than actually assigning the labels. You are checking whether something is correct or not, versus you have to categorize into five classes. So that way the validation is helpful. I mean, your point. I take your point. Yes, the manual intervention is needed, but firstly, it is optional. Secondly, it is less expensive with respect to time and effort. Hi, uh, Shoya. Here. Yeah, great presentation there. Yes. I wanted to ask you: Is there a possibility of extending this beyond classification problems? Yes. Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, like any specific question. I mean, yeah. for example, you can always just if I'm or do you want to continue with the question no no sure go ahead well regression is a definite possibility that you can actually apply and there has been some work that it has been done but only in the supervised setting it makes sense it mm -hmm. won't make sense in in an unsupervised setting because the labeling effort is not there in fact we are currently working I mean it's pretty, pretty premature stage that's why I didn't mention the transfer aware deep networks I mean can you actually train networks which are transfer aware again I mean deep ne deep learning is awesome but still you need label data, you need plenty of label data, right? Can you make them transfer aware? That's something we're working, so I, I, I'm not going to talk into that, but, but yes, that's possible. And any supervised setting you can actually put in, regression, ordinal regression, classification, um, any, anything, you can, you can apply transfer. The philosophy is very, uh, very much there. Thank you. Hi. Yep. Here. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, it's a follow-up question to what he asked. So uh, assume I am satisfactory with my validation set, like uh, the learning on the tar target domain I'm happy with. So does Empath uh, relearn uh, on, the, on this set? You already learned something on the uh, source domain. That model is there. So now consider the validation set as a new label set I'm passing. So is there any feedback going there and update the model? So in future, if I predict, my scores would be? It's possible. We are not doing that. It's okay. possible. So Empath doesn't? do that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Good question. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Thanks. So just uh, continuation to that uh, thing scenario suggested. Uh, let's say the validation fails. What happens next? Uh, of course, you ask them to uh, label it. So how much labeling is enough? 
Oh, oh that's that's that that's one of those magic machine learning parameters, right? So okay. we saw that like one tenth of the initial training data that people have used for source domain is a is a good number. But you can start off with very small, like I mean, here we are talking about training data size of few hundreds. Mm -hmm. So you can start off with like a couple of tens, twenty or thirty examples, and see that. And given that this is an iterative procedure, mm -hmm. so you don't have to kind of give a whole lot of examples at the very beginning itself. You can try out with a small and see what's the change, and. Uh, but but yeah, there is no specific number that I can suggest. But it's one tenth is a ballpark that we do go okay. with. So when do you actually say that the model is again ready to try it to them? So oh, after the an analyst can give an even one example uh -huh. and say that adapt and test. Okay. Uh, and then check that whether it is satisfactory or not. Right. It is we give as a recommendation that you give twenty five examples, for example, mm -hmm. and then train it and then see the performance. Don't give very less because it won't be good. And our contribution was to select those 25 examples and that is where active learning is something uh, we used all right all right okay thank you, thank you. hello it's here. yeah yeah uh, i have a question that is uh, when you tag the tweets we can't say a tweet is uh, constrained to a single topic if we consider uh, yeah iphone 5 s tweet it is a tweet about iphone 5 s they may say that for camera it's the best quality but they may say that the uh, battery is draining so Right, so we can't uh, tag that directly as a positive thing or a negative thing. So this is very good question. This is a this is a this there is a, again a subclass of sentiment categorization problem called aspect aspect based sentiment. Uh, is something again a very well researched topic which we did not look into here. The way I would like to kind of brush away this thing is that that's also I can model this as a classification problem. And instead of this positive negative classifier, I can build in an aspect oriented sentiment classifier and to uh, address that. But yes, that's a good point. It would be interesting to see that whether transfer learning works under those fine grained scenarios as well. Uh, we did do that. So that is the iterative. When I say uh, slow, I use the word in kind of in lieu of the iterative. Uh, so iterative as in that you can gradually feed in some examples to improve the model over over a period of time. In yeah. So actually what you're doing is a one shot transfer plus active learning which you're terming as slow. Slow iterative transfer. Bec the well, with the active learning examples, I'm still again doing transfer learning. Transfer learning can happen in presence of no label data or in presence of small amount of label data, as I introduced in the right. So when the active learning based samples are given, I'm not just doing. Uh, I'm not learning the classifier only based on the examples that are given as part of the active learning. I'm learning from the source domain collection and the act and the small amount of label data to. Uh, to obtain a better classifier, and that is why it is right to call as iterative transfer. Right. So I, I have also seen this kind of phenomena happening with small data, when you have very le less number of training items. Mm. So you go ahead using uh, other domain or similar domain kind of data. So how is this different from the other? Um, I didn't understand the question. I mean, what do you mean by? For example, uh, if I have very less amount of training data. Uh, Instead of training the classifier with that data itself, I go ahead and annotate. I, mean, I, I go ahead and supplement. Uh, that you said data. You, you said it. You annotate. Uh, annotate you as in I don't label them. Rather, I would bring in another readily available domain data and try to classify. It. Won't that fall in like very similar to active learning, where you learn in presence of very small amount of data and large amount of unlabeled? I don't actually. I I try to train the model using both the data sets, the small data plus a similar de domain data. Okay. I mean, I would say that that is more close to, closer to the semi-supervised learning scenario right. where we have li less amount of labeled data and a lot of unlabeled data. What the variation that you are bringing in is that this unlabeled data is not from the same domain. Okay. If you are doing something for the fact that this unlabeled data is from a different domain, then these two are similar. But if you are just bringing in a similar domain, d another domain's data, as because it is similar, it's a I would call that that's a semi-supervised learning, unless you are doing something for that. For example, this feature space mapping that we do to uh, ensure that these two, uh, this classifier training is happening on a space where this new domain's data is diff is kind of similar to the source domain data. If you do something like that, then it would be transfer learning. Otherwise, it would more like semi-supervised for me. In case I answered the question. <coughs> Okay, I think we'll need to intervene oh, sure. here. Uh, sure.
we've okay. run out Thank of time. You. Thank you very much. Uh, you can take it offline.